Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So inshallah, what I kind of want to talk about today when we're talking about, you know, the purpose or finding our purpose is really bringing it back to the greatest question in existence, which is why do we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why do we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, a lot of times we look at we look at being Muslim or the, the rules or the commandments of Islam just kind of like something that's like a to-do list. You know, my parents tell me that this is what I need to do. There are things that are good and right, and then there are things that are wrong and harmful. But at a deeper level, before we even appreciate and understand why those things are important, the first question we ask ourselves is, why is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so important? And why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as human beings and that the human being is unique? So I'm going to tell you all of a memory that each and every one of us have. And I want to ask you if you remember this memory or not. The memory is there, but I want to ask you if you remember it or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before any of us came into this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created our father, Adam alayhi salam, He took out all of the souls of all of His progeny, all of His descendants, all of humanity. And the souls of every single human being stood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah asked a very significant question that really defines our existence, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? So I want us all to close our eyes for a moment and really think deeply within ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before I came into this world, every single human being was brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and heard this divine address. You, me, and everyone else on the face of the earth was spoken to directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? It's kind of a rhetorical question. Which means, I'm definitely your Lord. Do you recognize that? And every single human being said, Bala shahidna. Indeed, you are, and we bear witness to that. So I want to ask you all a question. Does anyone remember that, being asked that? Okay, I don't see anyone's hands up. Why is it that we don't really remember it the way we remember other things? Does anyone know why? Any guesses? Does anyone take a guess? Zaru? That happened in a different life. Because it happened in a different life. Good. And there was another hand? Okay. Any other thoughts? The memories that we have in this world are memories that are stored in our brain. They're experiences from this world. That's not where this memory exists. It doesn't exist in the place where you have memories of things from this world and this life. So where is it? I heard someone say something. Your soul. Your soul. Exactly. Stored inside of your soul. And your soul is the essence of who you are. So people come into this world and you find many, 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 many people who are really looking for meaning. And they're looking for purpose. And they're looking for happiness and fulfillment. But one of the beautiful things is that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers, He sent them so that people could believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actually fulfill the purpose for which they were created. So that's what we're talking about today. Is that the purpose of your existence your purpose in life 
is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, realizing ubudiyya, realizing servitude, realizing really having a strong and living connection with the one who created you subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything else that we do of the five daily prayers, of the sunnahs, of doing the things that are pleasing to Allah and avoiding those things that are haram, of the way that we eat, the way that we dress, the way that we live our lives, all of those things stem from this first ultimate reality when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so that when we come into this world, we're able to reconnect with that memory and fulfill the promise that we made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions so far? Is everybody with me? All right. So, but we have a difficulty. There's a problem and a challenge, okay? Is that when people come into this world, a lot of times they try to find that purpose and meaning in worldly things. Sayyidina al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, the great Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, Anta bil-ruhi, la bil-jismi insan. You are through your soul, not your body, a human being. But when we come into this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created our body from worldly materials, from the earth. So part of us, our physical construction is worldly. But then our soul is from the heavenly realm. So the human being combines these two kind of heavenly inclinations, but then also the nafsi, worldly desires and inclinations as well. And much of our religious experience is really trying to give the preference to our, spirit, our spiritual aspirations and our heavenly inclinations. But a lot of people in the world don't do that. A lot of people really get caught up in the things of the world. So you find people when they come into this world, they think that the purpose of their lives and that their happiness is in what? Is in fulfilling their desires that come from their nafs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He did create us with those desires. So there is something that we have to do with those things. But the prophets and messengers, alayhim salam they gave us guidance on how to direct those desires in ways that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the amazing thing is that when you look at people of the world and you see how much effort they put into fulfilling their desires, whether that's fame, whether that's money, whether that is being seen as beautiful or desirable, whether that's seen as all of having cars and big houses and all of these various things that really stem from the nafs. Let me ask you all a question. How many of those people really seem fulfilled? I'm asking you all a serious question. What do you all think? When you look at famous and wealthy people who have all of these things of the world, how many of them seem really at peace? Not really? That's your, you honestly feel that way? I mean, I agree. That's my assessment as well. And then on top of that, you see despite the fact that they have everything that so many other people, this like 0.001% of people in the world who have everything that everyone else wishes they had, but still they seem depressed, they don't seem fulfilled, and in many cases they even take their own lives. Or they're just really addicted to different kinds of substances that just make them forget about whatever pain or emptiness they're experiencing, but then ironically only take them deeper into that, that dark pit of emptiness. So, so if we look at that and we take, you know, we learn from that, their example of, okay, all of those people. 
They're on TV all of the time. They have the nicest cars, the nicest clothes, the millions and millions of people follow them, all of that stuff. They still have broken relationships. They still seem to be very fragile people, even psychologically. You see that they often go through breakdowns or uh, even the media will kind of flip on them. One day they're, they're loved, the next day that they're ridiculed and mocked. So you realize, but even those people, they're searching for meaning. And many other people are searching for meaning, but they're looking for it in the wrong places. So if I think, let's say for example, I'm thirsty and I'm drinking salt water. It's just like, it looks like water. Right? It, you know, it's the same, it is water. It's a different kind of water. But salt water will never quench your thirst. That's like the dunya. It's like I'm looking for meaning. I'm looking for fulfillment. I, there's this really deep existential need within me for something bigger than just the, the, the little things that are currently available to me. So people just keep on drinking salt water, but they just get thirstier and thirstier and thirstier until eventually they die. What we realize, and this is why I really want to go through this with you, is that the purpose of our life is filling ourselves with that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that true honor, true happiness, true fulfillment comes in your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so that's kind of what we're, we're going to focus on now. La ilaha illallah. So we talked about that covenant that we took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that exists within us at a deep spiritual level. It exists within our spiritual memory. And that really sets us up in this world for seeking this meaning in our lives. That sets us up in our lives to really search for something bigger. And that's why a lot of people say, like, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of my existence? Is it just to make a lot of money, to have a lot of power, to have a lot of wealth and material things and then die? And then even some people went so far, like the Pharaoh, to actually be buried with their material things, as if those material things can follow them into the hereafter. They don't. But what is it that comes with you? What is it that actually defines your existence in this life and then for eternity? It is that you fill up your heart with the light of Iman. Is that you seek honor in the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made honorable. The more you connect to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the more honorable you become, the more that you understand your purpose in life, your responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on your shoulders, the more benefit, the more capable you are of leaving the world better than how you found it. Of contributing something that's actually worthwhile and meaningful. But there are so many things that are kind of like illusions that make us think that this is going to make me happy. This is going to make me beloved to people. This is going to make me feel fulfilled. How many of you bought, wanted to buy something, whether it was like a game or an item of clothing or something that you wanted so bad, and then when you got it, soon after you get it, you feel like it diminishes in your in your eyes. How many people felt that way before? I remember, I'll tell you a really funny story. There was a really nice shirt that I wanted to get. And I remember getting it, and my cousin also got it. We both had it. And when I saw him wearing it, I said, man, why does that shirt look better on him than it does on me? Hmm? That's because the nefs, that's how the nefs works. And then the more that you're able to realize my value, my worth, my happiness is not in that thing. What is this going to do? This is going to make me happy? 
clothing, the way that I look, even that's not going to make you happy. Because it doesn't really access and tap in to the purpose for which you were created. And a lot of people in this world, and one of the reasons why this is important to highlight, is because there are so many people in the world who uh, captivate others. They capture people's attention. People look up to them, oh, did you see what they did? Whether they're athletes or singers or actors and actors, whatever it may be. People are really captivated by the details of their lives. And then you might start to realize, well, maybe they have something that I need. And it works at a very subconscious level. Like most people don't think about those things like, oh, you have something I need. But then deep down inside, it's like, oh, if only I could be like that person. If only I had what they have. And so things would really be different. My life would really be different. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you is even greater than that. And it's much closer. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, what we just talked about, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّهُمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Prophet, remember when your Lord took the offspring from the loins of the children of Adam and made them bear witness about themselves. This happened to all of us. And Allah said, am I not your Lord? قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا They said, yes, we bear witness to that. أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ So you cannot say on the day of resurrection, we were not aware of this. Deep down inside, people are aware of this. But then with the dunya and with giving in to the desires of the nafs, it starts to really cloud that memory and veil that memory. And it becomes like a mirror that you can't see clearly through because it has rust and it has grime covering it. So you can't see anything reflected in it. But when you connect to the prophets and messengers, why do we pray? I'm asking you that question. Why do we pray? What, what's the end goal of, of salah? What's the ultimate outcome of the salah? Why is it so important? Yes. To get closer to Allah. To get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. To talk to Allah. To talk directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone else? Yes. To feel a deeper connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To feel a deeper connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent. All of those answers are correct. But oftentimes, if we look at the salah like, ah, oh, you know, I'm in the middle of something and it's time to pray, it's almost like I'm just going to do it to get it out of the way. The salah opens up a door between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even the angels in the heavenly realm, they get a portion of that. They don't even necessarily have that whole full opportunity or the same potential that's given to us in the salah. So when we look at it and we realize that this salah actually helps me attain the purpose for which I was created, it goes from being something that's just a, a chore to something that's actually an opportunity and something that becomes very beloved and special. But it all goes back to understanding what these things really are. Am I just praying because I don't want to go to hell? Or am I praying because I realize that I'm speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I am deepening my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm fulfilling the purpose for which I was created. And Allah increases me in honor, increases me in blessings, makes me more beloved to his angels, makes me more worthy of amazing spiritual gifts that nothing in the world could ever equal. That's what the salah really is. Right? So uh, it goes back to understanding our true purpose in life. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the scholars in Islamic history, he said, there is a sadness in the heart that can only be removed when you have uns, when you have this close connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a sadness in the heart that can only be removed 
that can only be filled, a hole in your heart that can only be filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you see so many people, they're looking for meaning. And actually one of the other things that's, that's worth mentioning, this applies to both men and women, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us as human beings to be hardwired to love. That's why you see, you know, so, uh, so many people are focused on love. And unfortunately, in today's world, in society, they've made love very superficial. It's not even love. They just, they, they uh, present love in a way that's really just something that's very, uh, almost like an animal desire. That's not love. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created within the human being this love of love. To be hardwired to love. Why? Because the greatest spiritual virtue, the greatest thing that you can possibly acquire is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. And you know, a lot of us, one of the, one of the deepest human needs is to be loved. Which is why, you know, the family unit, our relationship with our parents, our relationship with our children, Right? It's so important because it's a very essential human need to be loved. And then what happens to a lot of people is that as they go on in life, they continue to seek that. But sometimes, and especially in kind of popular culture, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're encouraged to find that in ways that have nothing to do with real love. And people, when they do that, they continue to feel emptier and emptier, which makes them wonder, you know, am I really doing it right? But then think about it. Let's take a, a, a small step back. Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the almighty, the all-powerful, the most gentle, the most merciful, the most generous subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like Him. His creation has no similarity to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is far, uh, uh, infinitely above them in His perfection, in His beauty, in His majesty, in His power, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, think of all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grandeur and His majesty, and realize that He has given us, little human beings, flawed human beings, the opportunity to become beloved to Him. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you His love, you don't need anything else in existence. All the money in the world is worthless in your eyes. All of the fame and the applause that people might give you means nothing if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you His love. I'll tell you an amazing story. There was one of the Sahaba, his name was Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa radiallahu anhu wa He's not uh, uh, very well known because he was younger. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa radiallahu anhu, he was sent by Sayyidina Amr ibn al-Khattab to a, a, a Christian king to teach him about Islam. So as he goes there, they're kind of uh, uh, taken prisoner, him and a group of Muslims, and the Christian king says, listen, I'll give you whatever you want. I'll give you half of my kingdom, and I'll marry you to my daughter. You will be my heir. You will inherit from me if you leave Islam. So then Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa radiallahu anhu, and salam barakatuh. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa radiallahu anhu, he says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would, even if you asked me to leave Islam for just a moment, and you would give me your entire kingdom, I would not leave Islam. So then this king starts to starve him. And he says, don't give him any food except alcohol, wine, and pork. And see if he buckles under the pressure. So they're bringing him food, they're bringing him things to drink, but they're all haram. 
So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hulafa, he refuses all of their food. Then finally the king threatens to take his life to execute him. And then he starts to cry. So the king goes, oh, now we got, he's starting to break. Now maybe his, his commitment to Islam, maybe we can now break him. So he says, why are you crying? He said, you know, when I realized that I can only die one time, I wished that I had a hundred souls and I could sacrifice all of them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what made me cry. Now I want us all to pause for a second. What kind of person can do that? You know what I mean? What kind, like what, what was the state of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa's heart to be able to go through that and to without even the slightest shadow of a doubt commit himself at that level? It's not something that is just a choice that you make in your mind. His heart and soul tasted the sweetness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. He had become someone who because of realizing and experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, nothing in existence could shake him. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that miraculous? I'll teach you all a hadith of the Prophet And this shows us once again, the purpose of our life and our potential. You know, when I was your age, uh, you know, my older brother, this is before the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there was just the Marvel comic books. So my brother used to collect the comic books. And we used to love all of these superheroes. You know, people who were, had these amazing powers and abilities. And I think part of the reason why we tend to love those things is because it speaks to that deeper existential question of doesn't my life mean more than just the mundane things that we go through? Isn't there more meaning? Isn't there more potential? So anyway, when my brother uh, taught me this hadith, you know, many years later, it reminded me of, you know, these amazing kind of stories, these journeys, these epic stories of people overcoming the most insurmountable odds and having this amazing transformation and accomplishing the, the, the most amazing things. The Prophet I want us all to pay attention to this. This is a very, very, very important hadith. And it's not important because you're going to be tested on it. It's important because when you learn it and you understand it, it opens up your potential, and it opens up opportunities in your life. So the Prophet wasallam, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Allah says to His creation, whoever shows hostility to one of my awliya, does anyone know what the awliya are? The awliya are the most righteous people, yes. The protecting friends. They are people who are so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He takes care of them. They are like the, the elect among the, the righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we call them awliya, we call them salihin, righteous people. In this hadith, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا Any of my awliya, any person who's a wali of mine, and another person shows hostility to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I declare war against that person. That's, that's intense. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I love this servant so much that if another person shows hostility to them, I declare war against that person. Then the hadith goes on to describe to us who are these awliya. How does someone become one of these elect and beloved servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How does that happen? So then the hadith goes on and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي 
بشيء أحب إلي مما افترضته علي الله سبحانه وتعالى says my servant draws closest to me with an, with an act that is most beloved to me which are the obligatory actions so think about that your salah your fasting in Ramadan your zakat when you get to a point where you're able to pay the zakat all of these things these obligations, the five pillars of Islam, the things that Allah has made obligatory and mandatory, and those things that are haram that we avoid, those are the things most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you fulfill those things, you actually are putting yourself in a position where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala potentially will grant you His love. So that's the most important thing are the obligations. The hadith goes on. وَمَا زَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّ And my servant continues to draw closer to me. Closer and closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a physical closeness, it's a closeness with your heart. Hatta until I love him or I love her. Then what happens if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you His love, what happens? فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ If I love him, كُنْتُ سَمْعُهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ I become the hearing with which he hears. وَبَصَرُهُ الَّذِي يَبْصِرُ بِهِ And the sight with which he sees. وَيَدَهُ الَّذِي يَبْطِشُ بِهَا And his hand with which he strikes. And his foot with which he walks. And if he asks me for something, I will surely give it to him. And if he seeks refuge in me, I will certainly provide him my protection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives each and every one of us that opportunity. I remember when I first read this hadith, I was like, man, this is, if you, Allah becomes the sight with which you see, the hearing with which you hear, the hand with which you strike, and Allah protects you, what greater honor is that? What greater honor is there than that? That's the potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in every single human being. That's the opportunity that every single human being has been given. And it's available to... Age is not necessarily a factor that... Uh, affects that. If you look at many of the Sahaba, people like Abdullah ibn al-Abbas and Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, if you look at many of the companions, they attained the highest levels of righteousness when they were still very young. Right? So it's not something that is limited by, by age. So this goes back to why do we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because our connection to Allah Jalla Jalalu, fulfilling the purpose for which we were created, all of that answers that deep existential. Does that come up Thank you very much. I like it. Thank you so much. All of that goes back to that memory that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala imprinted upon our souls. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to honor us. And He created us in order to give us. So when we come back to, why am I Muslim? What's the purpose of my life? What is it that I want to accomplish and achieve in my life? All of that connects back to this reality. All of that connects back to this meaning, which is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the opportunity to be beloved to Him. And that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows His love upon you, there is no greater sense of fulfillment, there is no greater achievement, there is no greater honor that can ever be compared. There's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about when a person becomes beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when Allah loves a servant, 
So let's say a person continues to establish the salawat and their obligations and their fara'id and so forth, and they continue to also voluntarily worship Allah and make dua and engage in dhikr and do all of these things that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once they come to that point where Allah grants them His love, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us what happens. That he calls out to Jibreel alayhi salam. إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَى جِبْرِيلٍ When Allah loves a servant, He calls to Jibreel. And He says, يَا جِبْرِيلٍ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فأحب. Oh Jibreel, I love such and such a person, so you love them. فَيُحِبُّهُ جِبْرِيلٍ Now just think about that for a second. Jibreel alayhi salam, the greatest of all the angels. When someone on this earth becomes beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they might not even know it. But Jibreel alayhi salam loves them and knows their name. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned their name. You know, if you're on social media, if someone that you really admire tags you or mentions you, it's like such an honor. Oh, they, they mentioned me. Like it's amazing how these words, they're actually the same words that we have in a hadith and there's a much deeper meaning spiritually, but it's the same word that someone mentions you or tags you or whatever it may be. Oh, this person remembers me. They thought about me. They put my name. They mentioned my name. And that's just a created being. All of those people, no matter who they are, if, they are, if they're beloved to Allah, then it's good that you love them. But if they're just like a regular person, that, and in some cases someone who might not even really be that virtuous or noble, it's not that big of a deal. That person breathes the same air. They go to sleep at night. They're just a regular human being that somehow got some fame and people took that to mean something. But what if Allah Jalla Jalla mentions your name? What then? And then he mentions your name to Jibreel alayhi salam. The hadith goes on. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Then Jibreel alayhi salam, he goes to the inhabitants of the heavens, of the heavenly realm. And he calls out to the people in the heavenly realm. Ya ahla sama, inna Allah yuhibbu fulan an ibn fulan fa'ahibbu. Allah loves so and so the son or the daughter of so-and-so, so you all love them. So then the people, the inhabitants of the heavens, love that person. And then that person has qabul, has a degree of acceptance on the earth. And that has you know, a meaning that, that uh, is deep as well. So it goes back to these, uh, this original concept of the purpose of our life is to rediscover the wisdom for which we were created. And alhamdulillah, you know, you all are here. We're all Muslim. We're already connected to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We already know about Islam. There are so many people like, you know, Sheikh Yahya who's teaching the, the, the adult, the adults. There are so many people who had to go through the darkness of kufr in order to find Islam. And then they really appreciated it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given it to us without any prior difficulty or effort on our part. So when we understand and rediscover the wisdom for which we were created, then the next thing is that we have to fulfill that. And when we fulfill that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fills your heart and soul with fulfillment, with contentment, with purpose, with benefit, with blessings, with knowledge. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to raise you and elevate you and make you beloved even in the, the heavenly realm. And many of the Sahaba, عنه, they would see angels and speak with angels. All of these amazing experiences. But it all goes back to that original interaction where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed us. So I'm going to leave it there, inshallah.
and uh, open it up to hear from you all any thoughts or uh, any questions that any of you have. Yes. Are ignorant and you haven't heard of like a lost message, and you go to Yom Kippur, and then you will uh, like automatically go to hellfire, even if you like were a couple. But then, in that uh, verse that you said, uh, at a studio, isn't that like a saying? No, that's a very good question. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. So the question was about uh, people who might not have ever heard about Islam or have never heard about the prophets and messengers, and then they die on the day of resurrection, they won't be automatically punished because they never had an opportunity. But how do we make sense of that? And the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they all uh, bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their Lord. So when we bear witness to that, we're accountable <laughs> Uh, we're accountable when we hear the message of the prophets so what happens is when the prophets and messengers come and they inform us about something that our fitrah our natural state already senses and you say you know you were created for a purpose that you have a creator and that you the way that you live in this world you will stand before Allah and he will judge you all of that goes back to this, uh, uh, the memory that's imprinted in our fitrah, in our souls. So when the prophets and messengers come, it's like they reignite, they rekindle that memory. But if a person never had that opportunity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. He does not hold them accountable without having the opportunity. Right? So... Uh, uh, and then the people who do hear about it, then they, they don't have an excuse because it already speaks to a deep reality within themselves. Yes? Um, so earlier we were talking about how people who, you know, are really rich and famous and stuff, oftentimes they're not really happy. Mm. And then we talked about how Islam is, like, if, if you follow it correctly, all these principles, they can make you and give you true happiness. Mm. What about people who are just like ordinary people mm -hmm. who say, you know, I found happiness in my religion mm -hmm. or I found happiness in my hobbies mm -hmm. and things like that. How does that work? Yeah, mashallah. That's also a really good question. Thank you. Um, so let me just take one small step back. So even when we were talking about uh, you know, people who are very wealthy and have all of these worldly things, that it doesn't fulfill them. So I just want to make a small differentiation between happiness and a sense of peace and fulfillment. Just, uh, I think that that's an important distinction because sometimes people who are uh, experiencing difficulties but they're patient, they might not necessarily be happy in that moment, but they might have a sense of peace and fulfillment in their Iman. So back to your question about people who might find happiness or uh, a sense of, of happiness in their, in their hobbies, in their skills, or even in their, in their work and their religion. Uh, a lot of times um, the goal is not necessarily just to be happy. Right? The goal is to have this complete and full alignment with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us and the purpose for which we were created. Right? So there is a, a, a strong possibility that people can find uh, a great sense of fulfillment in other things, right? but it's not the deepest sense of fulfillment. It's not really speaking to this existential uh, question that burns inside of many people, right? So it's not that uh, uh, it can, you know, no, it's either complete fulfillment or no fulfillment whatsoever, but we're talking about going to the deepest levels of why we're, we're, we were created. And there are many things that, you know, intelligent human beings have come up with, thoughtful people, whether it is, you know, being in touch with nature, 
whether it is uh, removing things that are unnecessary in our lives so that we don't have this you know, stress and strain. All of those things are uh, you know, uh, useful, but then getting even deeper than that, the purpose for which we were created. And really that can only be answered by the prophets and messengers, and accessed at a spiritual level. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. What happened to Abdullah ibn Hudayfa? Ah, beautiful. MashaAllah. What happened to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudafa? Hudafa. Close to Hudayfa. MashaAllah. So then, I'm so glad you asked that because I forgot to finish the story. So when he cried and he said, I, I wish I had a hundred souls that I could give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the king was like, this guy is not going to break. <laughs> like, how do you break someone? who continuously outdoes your schemes, like it's just so far beyond your, uh, your level that you're used to. So then the king says, listen, if you kiss my forehead, which is you know, a, an act of respect, if you kiss my forehead, I'll let you go free. And he said, no, I'm not gonna kiss your forehead. Because you're, you're, you're trying to humiliate uh, the people of Islam, and I'm not gonna give in to that. Like I'd rather you just take my life. He said, I'm going to kill you then. He said, kill me. He said, okay, if you kiss my forehead, I'll let you and the 300 other Muslims that we captured go. He said, you'll let the other 300 go as well? He said, yes. So then I'll kiss your forehead and humiliate myself for the safety of 300 other people. So then he kissed the king's forehead and he let them go. And when they returned to Medina, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, every Muslim should kiss the forehead of Abdullah ibn Hudafa and I'll be the first to start. And he was the Khalifa and he went to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudafa and he kissed his forehead to honor and respect him for the sacrifice that he made for, to save the lives of others. MashaAllah. Thanks for asking that. Any other questions or even reflections or comments? I'd love to hear from you all. I don't really believe in just you know, giving you all a lecture and telling you all things that you might have already heard before. I don't really want to hear from you on what your thoughts and feelings are. Yes? Um, a lot of religious Catholics and Christians believe that they have a true love for God. How do we know that we have a true love for God? Like, what would that apply to the day of judgment? MashaAllah. That's also a, a very good question. And it's important for us when we come to these kinds of questions, especially because we live in a diverse society, is that we're not, uh, we're not putting down other people, uh, but it's really important that we understand the significance of the truth, especially truth with a capital T that relates to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the case of, let's say, Catholics, or even people of other faiths, who are very devout and are seeking to fulfill their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So someone who's in touch with their fitrah, someone who looks at nature, someone who sees the signs of God, they actually very easily can fall in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings that we have and what this indicates of Allah's beauty and majesty and perfection. But what's even more important than our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is receiving His love. So Allah says in the Qur'an, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say, O Prophet, tell the people, say to them, if you love Allah, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Then follow me and Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. So there are a lot of people who naturally are seeking, I love God, I really want to dedicate my life to God. Be, and what's even more significant is receiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love in return. But the way to do that is through following the truth with a capital T that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. So those people, people who generally have faith, Allah has already put them in a special category of Ahlul Kitab. And there's a certain consideration and respect that is given to them on that basis. On the day of resurrection, Imam al-Ghazali, he has a really beautiful uh, breakdown of the three different categories of people who are not Muslim. Okay, there are three categories. 
Imam al-Ghazali doesn't say that all non-Muslims are entirely the same. Okay? So he says, the first category is like what we just mentioned not too long ago. Someone who grew up in a place where they never heard about Islam, they never heard about the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. they never learned about the Qur'an, so obviously they never became Muslim. So Imam al-Ghazali says this person is not held accountable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish them or hold them accountable because they never had a, a chance to begin with. The second category of someone who's not Muslim is someone who did hear about Islam, but what they heard was all of these very uh, uh, twisted lies about Islam that are not true. And actually Imam al-Ghazali says that, you know, they kill people and this and that and the other and making up lies about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and making it seem like something so uh, uh, evil. Imam al-Ghazali says it's, it would be impossible, it would be so far-fetched to assume that anyone who hears that negative description of Islam will say, oh, that sounds beautiful, I'd like to become Muslim. <laughs> Even this is far-fetched. You would be like, something's wrong with you. That attracted you. Right? So he says that category of people will also not be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many, many people in the world today fall into that category. They watch the news or they don't know anything really about Islam. He says the third category of non-Muslims are those who actually did hear about the message of Islam and it was conveyed to them in a way uh, that was uh, uh, clear and they did have an opportunity and they chose not to follow says that category of people will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can, apply that, uh, you can apply that to the different situations. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will ultimately judge, and we leave that with Him. Right? But those three categories, we can apply them to the different situations to get a sense of uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes? Earlier, uh, you were talking about how we really want Allah to love us, right? So, two things. Doesn't Allah to love already love us? Mm. So, is this love like a higher level of love? MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Are those the two things? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So, on one level, so the question is about that we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love us. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already love us? Uh, on one level, ulama scholars say that the act of creating, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, is an act of mercy. And it, that uh, universally, believers, non-believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through creating them, has already shown them an act of mercy. Uh, perhaps some might say an act of love as well. Right? There's a difference between that and this higher uh, level of love that is granted to those that fulfill Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments. That's like a much higher level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, is the, the light, is light and darkness equal, or someone who sees and someone who is willfully blind, i.e., they're blind to the truth. They cannot be equal. Right? So this is a, definitely, like you mentioned, a higher level and a very special kind of love. Whereas what is shared in that act of mercy for all of creation is one thing, but this is something above and beyond that. Jazakumakul Khair, that's a very good question as well. Let me ask you all a question. What do you think is the most difficult obstacle to fulfilling this kind of purpose? Oh, make it higher? Is that better? Jazakumakul Khair. What do you feel like is the biggest obstacle between you and achieving? the purpose for which we, you were created. Yes? Uh, I feel like in society it's kind of harder to practice um, what we are told to, like 
I don't know, if work lasts from a certain hour to another, um, maybe two, so long as you miss mm. Mm. And, and it's hard. MashaAllah. So she said that, you know, one of the things that's challenging is just the environment that we're in and being surrounded by, you know, the majority of people who, who might not be Muslim. And then if a person's working, for example, long hours, they might miss the time for prayers and so forth. So that's one challenge and obstacle. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Like to fight against your desires or mm. your nafs? To fight against your desires and your nafs. That's a big obstacle. MashaAllah. Yes. When people judge you and talk about you behind your back. Mm. When people judge you and talk about you behind your back. How many other people feel that way as well? That that's a hard one. That one's challenging. Aywa? There was another hand? Was it you? Yeah. I was just going to say like the dunya as a whole because mm. like there's desires to play with it and things that are like like the fad and other The dunya as a whole, right? That there are so many desires and the, uh, you know, even the people that we, uh, you know, see and interact with in the world and who have kind of influence on a lot of things, that's also very challenging. Yes? Islamophobia. Islamophobia, right? People who might have an antagonism against Muslims or talk about us behind our backs. Yes? Maybe if you're already Muslim, like inferiority complex. Mm. An inferiority complex, right? Feeling like, oh, you know, maybe because we're a minority, I'm not surrounded in a society that is majority Muslim, that maybe what they have is, is better than what we have. And even in many Muslim countries, they look towards the West in that same way. They think that, you know, Western culture and societies is like somehow this utopia, this heaven on earth. Yeah, those are all really good answers. Anyone else? Yes. Myself. Myself. MashaAllah. The nafs. The nafs is, a, is the biggest veil. Scholars say that the nafs is the biggest veil. Right? That the nafs is even more challenging than 70 shayateen, 70 devils. And it's right there inside of us. It's, you know, you can't disassociate from your nafs. MashaAllah. Anyone else? Okay, so... Let's talk about some of those things, okay? If we recognize and realize that there are these obstacles, whether it's Islamophobia or people's judgment, let's start with that. Yeah. Sorry, but the other side is taking a 15 minute break. Okay, okay, beautiful. Then you know what we can do? Check this out. Let's take a, a 10, 15 minute break, okay? We'll come back at 11.50. So as soon as the adults are done, we'll come back here at 11.50 and we'll break up into groups and we'll all talk about, we'll break up maybe let's say into six groups, three groups for the uh, young men and three groups for the young women and we'll talk about these things and then you can kind of present solutions to overcoming those obstacles. How does that sound? Okay, so we'll take a quick break and come back and discuss those things together, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, what we'll do now, remember before we took a break, we said that we were going to get into uh, three groups, three groups for the young men and three groups for the young women. Actually, what we can do is just maybe in, in the area here, this first row, you can all make a small circle. The second row, you can all kind of face each other. And the young women who are seated uh, uh, on the cushions, you all can make one group. And group number one, we want to discuss how do we overcome the obstacle of people saying things behind our back and people disliking Muslims. How do we overcome that obstacle? And group number two, we can talk about how do we overcome the world and the fact that there are so many things in our environment that get between us and fulfilling our purpose. And then group number three, you can discuss how do we overcome the obstacle which is within our own selves, our own nafs. Okay, so we're going to take five minutes and then each of you can, you'll have one representative who can speak on behalf of the group and we can do the same for the young men. Uh, the, the, the rows, so you all, the young men, a few of you can come to the front here. 
And we can make a group and you can discuss in that same order. So the first one is, how do we overcome the obstacle of people who say bad things about Islam or uh, talk about us behind our back or Islamophobia? The second row and the second group can talk about worldliness and how we overcome that obstacle. And the third group you all can discuss how we overcome our own nufus, right? In order to accomplish and achieve our purpose in life. So you all have to come together and start discussing. Bismillah. And we'll just st uh, spend five minutes doing that. For backbiting, what you should do is mainly just ignore it mm. and turn it into something positive and pray for the person who's backbiting for you, the backbiting about you. Mm. And I think it's in ayah in Surah Al-Tafameen, in the Lina Ejshim Al-Kan, in the Lina Amun, we have Paco and Mashallah. And it's pretty much it. Mashallah. Can you translate the meaning of that? Uh, I'm not sure, but... Why? That the, the disbelievers would make fun of... The disbelievers the, would be a puffle and they'd laugh at you? No. Nah, they, would, they would laugh at the believers, right? So that's something that, even in the time of the companions and the prophets and messengers, it was always there. Right? MashaAllah. Any other suggestions? Or that was primarily it? Okay. MashaAllah. So let's just discuss that a little bit. Because there were some very good things mentioned there. And one of the one of the beautiful things, there was a practical element, and then there was also another element. Is everyone with me? Another element related to understanding our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how superior that is to every other relationship. And how our connection to Islam and our connection to the Prophet وسلم, is the greatest honor is accepting the fact that not everyone's going to like you. And when you're comfortable with that reality, and when you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, then you're actually empowered in, a, in an amazing way. Like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Hudhafa radiallahu anhu who we just spoke about, he wasn't interested in anything that that Christian king had to offer him. He wasn't interested in what anyone thought of him his only concern was uh, his connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking higher and higher levels with him. So that's really beautiful. And then also the practical element that was mentioned is making dua for those people and making sure that we are representatives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so that this deen can spread even to those who might say bad things about us today. And then maybe, uh, you know, in a short while, a year or ten years from now, they might become Muslim, inshallah ta'ala. Beautiful, thank you for that. So now we'll go to, we'll go to the young men in group number two and then the young women. So the group number two, in this circle back here, you all were covering how to overcome this obstacle of worldliness, right, and the world and the, the desires of the world. Okay, we had... No, there's also, I think, people following online, so... There we so we had uh, two things. Okay. So one was, we thought of life as like a placement test mm. uh, for your position in the opera. And then we also, our thing was, we don't know when we're going to die. We always hear about people dying. We never think about what if that was us. It's like, are we ready to die? Mm. And it's like, not yet. Or no, we aren't sure. And it's like, we should always be willing to let go of what we have in this life and be ready to go to the next. Be wanting to go to the next. MashaAllah. Yeah. We also had a, a few more points. One was that you have to remember that this life is transient. It's not It's not permanent, right? Like, it's like a place to test. It's not, this is not where we want to really be successful and rich. Sure, being successful in this life is great, but that should always be with the goal of ending up in the Akhira, right? And the second thing was, you need to keep in mind that this world is not really permanent, and you do that by surrounding yourself with like-minded people. So, people who are good Muslims, right? You can't just be a Muslim because you have Muslim friends who might not really be concerned about where you end up. And if you have non-Muslim friends, they should be friends who don't distract you from your goal of the Akhirah, right? So if you're at a movie theater, 
with your non-Muslim friends, and you need to pray Maghrib. Mm -hmm. You should have the kind of friends that will say, yeah, go take five minutes and pray, right? We'll be waiting for you. Not the kind of friends who will say, no, just stay here with us. It's fine. You can skip your prayer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Then if we go to the, or is that the, the end of group number two? Okay, if someone can take the microphone to the sisters, the young ladies. Number two, group number two. Who's going to speak on behalf of the, the second group of the young ladies? Here. Okay, is that your sister? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, who's, who's going to speak on your behalf? There we go. Thank you. Um, we came up with being grateful for what you have. Okay, mashallah. And how does being grateful for what you have help you overcome the obstacles of, of the world and the desires of the world? Or what other what other suggestions or ideas did you all come up with? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Is there anyone in the group who, who has a suggestion that, that was mentioned? <coughs> Okay, we can go on to the third group. You can pass it to the to the third group behind you. And this was talking about how to overcome uh, things stemming from the, the nafs, right, from our own selves, how to overcome that obstacle that sometimes gets in the way of us fulfilling our purpose. Hold on. Um, so we were thinking about kind of like learning about uh, what you can do better and then also practicing that. Um, and maybe by practicing you could read the Qur'an and, I don't know, uh, kind of surround yourselves with better people uh, who do want to achieve the same thing or are doing the same thing. And by doing, by surrounding yourself, you kind of take some of the characteristics that they have and put it in yourself. Mm, excellent. Did you want to add to that? Who? You. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, any other, any other uh, suggestions or ideas from that group? Okay, then we can pass it to the third group of, of young men, if you can just pass them the microphone. And then your representative can speak about some of the ideas that you all had. Is that normal? Okay, so um, we just came up with, um, like, make your art to help, but not to help, like, avoid distractions of this world um, and like distract yourself with like good things like liquor and prayer and try to humble yourself like don't be too distracted with this world and because it's nothing in this world will matter when you're dead except for your good deeds and your bad deeds. Mashallah. Mm. Mashallah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. When, uh, when the topic went on to us, uh, how to deal with this world, it reminded me of a hadith I heard about how uh, our time in this world is similar to just the time of traveling by resting under the mm -hmm. earth. Really Mashallah. He was saying that when we were, uh, when thinking about how temporary this world is, it reminded him of a hadith of the Prophet. Where he said that the life of this world, the time that we spend in this world is like someone coming and sitting under the shade of a tree for a short while, then continuing on their journey. Right? So mashallah, those were all excellent uh, suggestions and ideas. Uh, and one of the major things, and this is really kind of, you know how they, there's uh, pro tips, when you're trying to really achieve something, people who've accomplished it and people who have achieved those things, they find ways of simplifying that for others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of time, for the last community of believers that would ever be on the face of the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made things simple and straightforward and achievable for the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The shortcut, as uh, you know, we always hear that the, the, the easy way to accomplish everything that we've talked about, fulfilling your purpose in life, attaining Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's love, having the strength and the fortitude 
to overcome the criticism of people, to overcome the desires of the world, to overcome the, trips, the tricks of the nafs and the shaitan. The way to achieve all of those things is to strengthen your connection with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa And you know when we send salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa what happens spiritually is something really amazing. And what happens is that your soul, remember how we were talking about, you know, these memories of the soul and the capabilities of our soul and how when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, He gives them all of these openings of becoming the hearing with which they hear and the sight with which they see. When you send salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you learn about his life, when you try to embody his beautiful character, when you love him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, your soul is brought closer to his soul. There's like a connection that takes place. Right, you know how we have like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi? And you have these connections that can take place that are invisible. But there's a connection. Right, this microphone here is wireless. But there's something here that connects it to the system that then makes it uh, convey my voice. When you send salawat upon the Prophet, your soul becomes connected to him. And when your soul becomes connected to him, all the doors of goodness open up for you, of fulfilling the purpose of your life, of finding fulfillment, of actually having a purpose. And one of the greatest purposes that we have as Muslims, you know, we were talking a little bit about inferiority complex, and people speaking of us in negative ways and things of that nature, when you're connected to the Prophet ﷺ, your heart fills up with mercy such that you want good for everyone in creation. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people that He chooses who become people, they, they're like servants of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and they become people who spread the lights of guidance to other human beings. They become like the chosen people who the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ is spread to people through them. But all of that comes back to loving the Prophet ﷺ, sending salawat upon him so that your soul is then connected to his soul. And then you know if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, right, you start to get all the information and you start to, you're able to download things and you're able to receive from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, those things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you fulfill all of these other uh, aspects that are noble of being a source of mercy and benefit for humanity, of understanding your own purpose, of having that sense of peace and serenity and fulfillment. So that's one practical takeaway from today is that we all, should have a portion of uh, sending salawat upon the Prophet ﷺ. And then another thing that we should commit ourselves to is always learning about his life. Always learning about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. There are so many amazing wisdoms and lessons and every single thing that we go through in our lives Every difficulty, every challenge, all the ups and downs, all of that, the answers to all of that are found in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa And whenever we look at his life, we can see what he went through and we can apply it to what we're going through right now. And then we also see his mercy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he wanted good for people, how he was able to transform people's hearts and then that also inspires us to be sources of benefit and goodness for our friends and our neighbors and all the people that we meet and all the people in our lives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that this is true life. Remember we were talking about the purpose of life and we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to each and every one of us and said, Alastu bi rabbikum? And that when we fulfill that, we are brought closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We 
uh, uh, actualize the meaning for which we were created, the purpose of our existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of the Quran that do you see the one who was dead and we brought him back to life. وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ And that he had a light that was with him when he would walk among the people. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse talks about the person who was dead and then brought back to life, it wasn't someone who was physically dead. And the ulama, scholars, they say that this verse was about Sayyidina Hamza عنه, or Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab when Allah put Iman in their heart, when they connected to the Prophet and they were able to really access the purpose of their existence, it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them back to life. That's true life. That's truly living is when your heart is filled with Iman and you're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Prophet And then on top of that, that person, Allah gives them a nur. He gives them a light that then emanates into the lives of other people, that then benefits and brings blessings to the lives of other people. So each and every one of us, when we send salawat upon the Prophet wasallam, and when we learn about his life, we benefit ourselves and we bring life to our own hearts, and then we become sources of benefit for humanity. And that is some of the most meaningful aspects of our lives, realizing our own ubudiyah and servitude and benefiting creation and benefiting humanity. Sayyidi, would you like to, to add anything? We can bring you the microphone. Inshallah. We're very fortunate to have Amul Tarif here, mashallah. And for those of you who are in the area, you know, this is a, Amul Tarif is a great resource that, that you all can benefit from, and inshallah you will benefit from. Bi'idhnillah. Any comments or questions before, before we close for the day? Yes. I was reading in a book that, like, the Prophet ﷺ, some had jinns, like, inside, or I don't know if I really understood it right, but, mm. but they were good jinns, and, like, they advised good things. Is mm. that something that's exclusively available to the Prophet, or is that also something that's so the question, so the Prophet ﷺ, he was sent with guidance, and he was sent to all of humanity and also all of the jinn. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of a particular, more than one, but of a particular incident where he was teaching the jinn about Islam and reciting the Qur'an to them and they were discussing it and so forth. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he was also uh, had access to the world of the unseen. We don't see the jinn, most people don't see those things, but the Prophets uh, they have access to that. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he uh, you know, would, would speak with the jinn and sit with them and so forth. Um, I don't know uh, the, the way that it's accessible to other people, but for the most part, that's something that uh, is is relatively unique to the prophets and messengers, but there are people, as we said, the awliya, who might be able to have uh, a certain what is called unveilings. They see certain things from the unseen. Wallahu a'lam. Any other questions or, or comments? What's one thing that, that you've taken away from today? What's like a lesson that you all learned? Yes. MashaAllah, beautiful. That, you know, all of the things that are on this earth, they're going to fade. They're not going to last. The things that are really worldly. But the only thing that really matters is your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful. Yes. So we learned about the purpose of life. MashaAllah, that we learned about the purpose of life. Excellent. Anyone else? Yes. You said like only our connection to Allah matters. What about connections to anyone else? MashaAllah, that's a good question. So we're going to get to you, inshallah. 
that your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all that matters? What about your connection to anyone else? There are, when we say that your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all that really matters, we mean in the absolute, the most absolute sense. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that other relationships and other connections are very important. Your relationship with your parents, your relatives, your neighbors, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us that these things are very important. So those things are also important as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the reason we wanted to emphasize that is because we start to be pulled in so many different directions and we assume that, you know, that what this person thinks of me or having fame and followers and having all of those things is really what matters. Uh, but those things are not valuable in and of themselves. But those relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to maintain and to honor, they're, they're also, by extension, very important and honorable. You were going to say something? Um, I learned what I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I learned that the relationships that I have with my parents and my relatives, they're not important. They're not valuable. You don't have to, only if you want to. Okay, alhamdulillah, good. MashaAllah, anyone else? What's the takeaway that you're going to, to go home with today? Yes, back there. If you have Allah, you have everything. MashaAllah. If you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have everything. If you have Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. Allah will honor you. Allah will fulfill your needs. You have everything. Like Imam Ibn Atta Allah Sakandari, he says, whoever has Allah, what have they missed out on? And whoever doesn't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what have they truly gained? You can have all, you can go to the, you can be the smartest person in the world, you can go to the, the moon, or you can go to Mars, or you can go wherever, but if you don't even know why Allah created those things, or that there is a creator who created those things, what good is all of that going to do? Nothing. And then the person who does have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have everything in this life and the hereafter. Thank you. Yes? Um, I was just going to say that uh, maybe, the, I guess my takeaway point was is to try to find like Allah and the beauty of everything that I see around me. Mm -hmm. And Ashi. like have a more deeper appreciation of like rather than, oh, this flower is so pretty, mm -hmm. like, mashallah, that Allah has given me the eyes. The ability to see color, the, you know, just... MashaAllah. Beautiful. Is that uh, being able, whenever seeing any of the beauty that we see in creation, is actually taking a little bit more time to appreciate that this is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even our ability to appreciate it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Inshallah, mm. beautiful. That there is a void, there's a hole in our hearts that can only be filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Beautiful. Jazakumul mm. khair. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, one thing, <clears throat> sorry, one thing that I learned today was that um, establishing a deeper connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can um, give you a lot of benefits in this life and in the hereafter. Nah. MashaAllah, beautiful, is that having a deeper connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefits us in this life before the hereafter, right? Is that when we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, His blessings, He provides for us, He honors us, He brings good things into our lives and wards off harm from us. But that doesn't mean that everything is always going to be just uh, happy and joyful. Sometimes there's also difficulties, but even in those difficulties, we witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is assisting us and supporting us and helping us through those things before even the hereafter. And if you imagine other people who don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't have that connection, nothing makes sense. Nothing has meaning. Good things and bad things, all of it ultimately amounts to nothingness and meaninglessness. And that kind of mindset uh, creates a very evil type of despair. Allah tells us that the shaitan, he wants people to, to despair. He wants people to, 
always be in a state of panic and fear. And one of the greatest ways to accomplish that is cutting them off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Sorry, I was related to my question earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, obeying your parents is one of the, probably the big, the one door to Jannah. Nah. And so, you know, and you're... Where's the microphone? Can we pass it forward? Yeah, my Turn on power and turn on the power. So, like I said, um, obeying, obeying your parents, one of the doors to heaven. Like, and, you know, about your spouse, like you'll be in heaven with your spouse. After you get uh, God's love, mm -hmm. will any of those connections matter? Ah, mashallah. So, that is a very good question as well. Once after a person receives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, Will those other relationships matter? The reality is they'll matter even more because the person at that point, let's say for example, a person has this very high degree of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their heart is filled with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. It doesn't mean that all other relationships are cut off, but rather they honor those relationships even more because the more they love Allah, the more they fulfill his commandments. And they honor those things that are uh, honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali, he says that when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that's connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part of that love. So the, the, the beloved of Allah, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, becomes more beloved to you the more you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes more beloved to you because the lover of your greatest beloved is beloved. You love the Kaaba, the Quran, the righteous people in the Ummah. You love all of those things. You love the average Muslim just for being part of the Ummah of the Prophet and a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even more so, the more your love increases for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not mutually exclusive, but it actually influences and adds to your life. Any other questions or reflections? Oh, yes. I think I learned uh, the proper way to think of salah not as a chore, but like as a fulfillment of an obligation. MashaAllah. Beautiful. They're not looking at the salah as a chore. You know, one of the other things I wanted you all to take away uh, is that when we have difficulties in life, and one of the things that's natural is that life has its ups and downs. When we have difficulties in life, yes, you can talk to someone about it, you should talk to a loved one about it, especially if it's something really challenging. If you need to talk to someone about something that you went through or the way that you're feeling, that's a good thing. But whenever we go through challenges, we should also flee to the salah that we should find salah and uh, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of, if not the greatest way that we approach our difficulties and problems is that when you turn in the salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if you're entering into his courtyard. It's as if, as one of the, uh, the young men said before, that you're speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as if you have a direct line. You know, if you, if you wanted something done and you wanted to talk to someone powerful who could get it done, it would take so much work just to get their number or just to have an audience with them. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that door is wide open whenever we want. And even in those times where maybe we're not in a place or a, a, a position to pray, we can always make dua. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left that door completely open for us. All right, so we always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We realize that we're given this audience with the King of Kings, Jalla Jalal. Right, and that the salah is this beautiful opportunity. And when we have a rough day or we have a difficulty that we don't know how to solve or we have any need, we should go to the salah. And we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill our needs 
and seek the fulfillment of everything from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala along with the other means that are available to us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who says, Kun fayakun. Yeah, inshallah. Anyone else? Any other final thoughts or reflections or questions? Or a takeaway that you want to share from today? Inshallah. Okay, inshallah we'll just end with a dua. Uh, but before we end with that dua, uh, I want to thank you all really. I came here from Pennsylvania. I don't know if you all know that. Uh, uh, and uh, we're here just for the weekend. And I appreciate the opportunity to sit with you all and to meet you all and to learn about you all and to hear your reflections and your questions and your thoughts. Uh, and I pray, I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that this was beneficial and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you all and your families. Uh, but it's really, really important that we talk about these things and you're able to really understand your connection to Allah and this deen and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, at a deep level. It's really, really important. You know, we were at a time where it's not just that uh, we're going to be Muslim because our parents are Muslim or people are telling us to do things. We actually have to learn and have a deep understanding and work through, you know, the challenges that we face in our lives so that we can see the truth and the wisdom of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of be with you all. And I pray that it's beneficial. And inshallah we'll, we'll end with a dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa afdalu s-salaa wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad in tibbi al-qulubi wa dawaiha wa aafiyat al-abdani wa shifaiha ونور الأبصار وضيائها وقوت الأرواح وغذائها وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب O oh Allah, we ask you, O oh most merciful, that you look upon each and every one of our hearts and that you fill our hearts with Iman, Ya Arham ar -Rahimin. We ask you, Ya Allah, that you show us truth as truth and grant us the ability to follow it. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to show us falsehood as falsehood and that you grant us the ability to avoid it, Ya Arham ar -Rahimin. We ask you, Ya Allah, that you fill our hearts with light and you fill our hearts with Iman and that you make us, Ya Arham ar -Rahimin, young people who grow up and are cultivated and nurtured through obedience to you and our connection to the beloved Prophet Muhammad We ask you, Ya Allah, that you make each and every one of us a key that opens up the doors of goodness for all of creation and barriers against evil and harm and the things that are displeasing to you, Ya Arham ar -Rahimin. We ask you, Ya Allah, that you make each and every one of us beacons of light who reflect the light of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma wa tafarruqana min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'afina wa la minna shaqiyan wa la mahruma ya arham ar-rahimin ala hadhi niya wa ala ma nawama shaykhana fi khayrin wa lutfin wa afiyah al-fatiha ila hadrat al-nabi Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين جزاكم الله خيرا. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.